Well, good morning, everyone. Uh -huh. Good morning. Thank you very much. How about that food? Was that food good? Yeah. There's still plenty more. Help yourself. In the interest of time, we wanted to start moving ahead with the program, but feel free to uh, move up and uh, help yourself. Forget your New Year's resolutions and uh, help yourself there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is the 15th annual Martin Luther King Jr. Community Breakfast that we've had at the college. Uh, it's our annual opportunity to celebrate the life and contributions of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, one thing I always say though, we don't want to limit it to a day or African American History Month or Women's History Month or whatever it is. It's a 365 uh, day tribute that we should uh, uh, embrace uh, for ourselves. Um, <clears throat> it's tradition here to celebrate his legacy and it's appropriate that we do so because of uh, what Dr. King held dear is what we hold dear at Bristol Community College social justice, equality, opportunity for all, and then these are our standards and our goals. Uh, we also uh, want to uh, keep in mind that uh, we lost uh, Maya Angelou this year and uh, uh, her great legacy. Uh, she's a civil rights award-winning poet and civil rights activist and playwright, uh, talked often about reading, the turning to reading for salvation uh, uh, from a traumatic and difficult childhood that she endured. And of course, Nelson Mandela, also uh, gone now, a fabulous uh, heroics figure in, uh, in international affairs. Um, we cannot uh, ignore some of the things that are going on in society today in America and across the world. Um, we in America still continue to grapple with uh, two what I call twin evils of our society, uh, racism and the privilege of whiteness. Uh, and we could involve gender uh, as well in this. So uh, these are things that we must keep discussing in, the, in our society uh, in a civil manner, uh, try to come to grips. Uh, tomorrow is our convocation uh, as the faculty and staff and uh, come back to uh, re resume work for the spring semester. And I'm going to mention, uh, emphasize how we seem to be talking about race in, uh, in separate groups and not across the groups. Uh, and this is something I want to be sure that we uh, fix uh, at Bristol Community College this semester uh, by talking away from each other in our own little groups. We reinforce stereotypes, we reinforce uh, all of the uh, predisposed biases that we have, uh, no matter what the race or what the gender, and, uh, and little, is, uh, little is accomplished. So we must, we must reach out and we must embrace in Dr. King's spirit. Uh, another thing I always say at this breakfast uh, why, uh, about Dr. King was uh, uh, when he was in jail in Birmingham and the black ministers would say to him, Martin, why are you causing all this trouble? You're just causing, th making things more difficult for us. Why are, you, why are you there? And he said, I'm here because that's where injustice is. And that so spoke uh, so eloquently of his uh, commitment and something that we must embrace as well. Well, I'm pleased to uh, introduce now, as we get started, um, our uh, musical group, Music One, who will perform for us. Music One is an innovative enrichment program designed to support and educate youth by cultivating their talents in original positive music and multimedia projects, while providing mentoring and leadership development and empowerment. We are delighted that they could join us today. Music One. Please welcome. Good morning. How are we doing today? Let me hear you say yeah. Oh, come on. Now I want you to wake up with me. We're going to have some fun. Let me hear you say yeah. Pleasure and an honor. We have a couple of songs that we'd like to sing for you guys today. Um, 
So all of our songs are original. Uh, we extend for the power of positivity. Our goal is always to motivate and inspire others, young kids, you know, around the country. We've traveled all the way from New York, cross country to California, hit a couple states in the middle, um, always reaching towards community, trying to inspire, um, send that inspirational message. So like I said, we have a few songs for you guys today. And this first song that we're gonna sing is entitled, Together We Can Better the World. It's really simple, you're gonna catch on. If you'd like, you can get up, you can sing along, and you can dance with us. So um, here we go. Here's our book. Shut 
we are a program and we do go all over the nation speaking to you know young kids, inspiring them, letting them know that they're not a product of their community, but rather they're a product of their expectations. Just because you come from you know the ghetto, you don't, you don't have to be in the ghetto. You can be a lot more. You set the bar. So um, support what we do. We'll be on this side. Thank you. Music one, ladies and gentlemen, they're fabulous, yeah. Now every year, I'm so proud to say that our elected officials make us a priority to come and, uh, and celebrate with us. And uh, I'm so pleased that uh, Congressman Bill Keating has come and uh, has joined us to help this celebration. And I would invite Congressman Keating uh, to come up and uh, bring words of welcome. Congressman William Keating, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I will say in advance uh, to Dr. Pilgrim, I apologize. I'll be going to her hometown uh, from here in Wareham, and I won't hear her inspiring words, but. Uh, I'll give your regrets in your hometown. And to Shelley Correa, I will leave a uh, citation from Congress at the time that that will be presented along with the others. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Dr. Sprager. Thank you for hosting this. Thank you for the great job you do enriching lives here every day. And it's great to be here with my colleagues in government, uh, newly elected mayor, newly elected DA, and all my colleagues in the legislature uh, it's great to see you. We have a great team and work together. I can't, my life changed in terms of looking at Martin Luther King Day several years ago uh, when I went to Congress and I went to the Capitol building and uh, a colleague of mine still, uh, Congressman John Lewis from Georgia was there. I went to his office. You'll see him uh, in the motion picture Selma, his role being uh, acted in that, in that film. Uh, and I went to his office uh, at the time, and I looked out, and they gave him the office uh, when we were in power, overlooking the reflecting pool and, the, and looking back into time and seeing the March on Washington, and, which I saw on television and remembered as a young child. Uh, and I realized that person I spoke with spoke at that event. And when I looked out at that pool and beyond and imagined the people that were there, I said, could they ever imagine that that young man that was speaking that morning would be occupying that office in the capital of the United States or that we would have an African-American president of the United States? So uh, it gives me chills thinking back to that day. But not all of us can have the dramatic opportunities and go on courage of going back into time the way Dr. King and people like John Lewis did years ago. But going back in that time, uh, I remember the 60s a little bit, and I remember one phrase that was very prominent, and it was, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And to me, that is the message that we have here today and, and Dr. King's remembrance. It's a message of civil involvement, and it could be anything. There's no excuse for any of us not to participate in this. You could be helping third graders and second graders by showing them the power of the bystander to speak up when young people are being bullied. You could work with scouts who are doing civic involvement and doing conservation programs for the cities and towns. Or you could be working with church groups, dealing with issues of bringing food to people that need it or comforting people when there's a death or giving rides to people back and forth to the hospital as I had the opportunity to do. But it's important and it's powerful when we do this together. Just looking at the events worldwide in the last two weeks, the attacks uh, on Charlie Hebdo and the horrific desecration of Nigerian communities and the slaughtering of thousands of innocent lives in Africa by Boko Haram. And we understand that not only in our country, but worldwide, we must be that voice. We must speak we must become involved. And that includes voting. Dr. King 
gave the following quotation, which will tell you how much his life was committed to having this right as a US citizen. He said, so long as I do not firmly and irrevocably possess the right to vote, I do not possess myself. I cannot make up my mind because it is made up for me. I cannot live as a democratic citizen observing laws I helped enact. I can only submit to the edict of others. And as we look around and we find out just a few months ago in our own country that only 33% of the people exercise this right to vote and look at other countries in the world where countries like Estonia where there was a strong remembrance of military and communistic power and totalitarian rule over them where they approach up to 60% of the vote and countries like Norway where 75 to 85% of the people vote we know we must do better. Not all of us can live the lives uh, of a John Lewis, of a Dr. King, but we can live their message. And each of us should commit ourselves today to once again move forward and to make sure we get involved and stay involved and make a difference. This will keep our country strong and it will keep the freedom that Dr. King died for alive. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Keating. The Congressman mentioned other people here, um, and I would uh, <clears throat> like to take a moment to uh, recognize some of the people who are here, uh, elected officials. Uh, we have no particular order. We have uh, Representative Alan Silva. Alan Silva. <laughs> Representative Steve Howitt. Steve Howitt. City Councilman Michael Mioza. <laughs> Senator Michael Roderick. Senator Roderick. <laughs> we have the President of the uh, Fall River Chamber of Commerce, Rob Melian. Rob Melian. <laughs> and I think making his first public appearance, the di District Attorney, Tom Quinn. There's the District Attorney. <laughs> Welcome, Tom. I hope it will be a long tradition. Uh, Representative Carol Fiola. <laughs> Representative Paul Schmidt. <laughs> City Council, Linda Pereira. <laughs> Fall River School Committee, Joseph Martin. New Bedford School Committee, Marlene Pollack. Marlene Pollack, our own professor at BCC. <laughs> Former Senator Joan Menard. Joan Menard. Yeah. <laughs> Trustee, Cynthia Rose. Cynthia Rose. <laughs> and we have educators here from Fall River, Sandra Arnold from the Cuss School. Sandra Arnold. Jackie Onfield from Fall River Public Schools. Jackie. Karen Graca from Cuss Middle School. Karen. Stephanie Baker, also from Cuss. Stephanie. Sherilyn Feeney from Spencer Borden. Sherilyn. Now, I hope there's no one I miss. Is there anyone I miss? Okay. Hey. Oh, I missed someone. <laughs> yeah, I got the mayor coming. Jackie from the uh, New Bedford School Committee. Pimento. I apologize. Thank you. And we have another distinguished guest that we'll be hearing some from a little bit later. Also making, I think, his first public, one of his first public appearances, Mayor C. Samuel Sutter. Take a bow. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now, following uh, uh, Congressman Keating's uh, uh, words, we also have on video, some of the elected officials couldn't be with us, and we have Congressman Joseph Kennedy on video, if we could uh, play that now. Hi, everybody. I'm disappointed not to be able to share this day with you at BCC, but I want to thank you for the kind invitation for allowing me to say a few words, for taking the time to recognize such an important day. For me, the most remarkable thing about Dr. King was the amount of faith that he had in this country, despite every reason for doubt. In the face of rampant discrimination, unceasing violence, and senseless hate, he remained steadfast in his belief that the American people held the potential to shape our country's morals and laws. In remembering a man whose bravery knew no bounds, we look for what is bold within ourselves, for our own capacity to make history, even if our stories never make the textbooks, for our willingness to raise our voices when confronted by injustice, and for our determination to demand change when our system falls short. Dr. King understood that capacity. He knew that the content of this nation's character is defined less by the moments of individual action than by those fateful times when our experiences collide, where our stories meet. He was a poet and an orator who knew that words without an audience were only words, no matter how poignant. The dream he so powerfully outlined on that hot August day, 1963, would have mattered little had it not been for the hundreds of thousands of brave believers in the crowd, ready to take his message back home to the streets of their cities and towns where it mattered most. Today, we are as interconnected as we are interdependent. As a, our country wrestles with tragedy in Ferguson, Cleveland, Staten Island, and Brooklyn, calls for justice, peace, and understanding echo from coast to coast. And Martin Luther King Jr. resonates deeply in those voices. So today, we take extra care of those we love. We show extra compassion to those who need it most. And we remember a man who found grace and kindness in this country's darkest hours. Most importantly, we pledge to live up to the faith that he put in each of us. Thank you so much, and enjoy the day. Congressman Joseph Kennedy, thank you. We'll be hearing from the two senators a little bit later. <clears throat> um, I hope that you can have a chance to participate in some of our other activities uh, as we launch African American History Month. Uh, and uh, the activities are listed on our BCC webpage, and you're certainly invited, and uh, the cost is, uh, is right. It's uh, free, they're all free, and uh, we hope that you can make it. Also, I hope that you can take advantage of this offer. I'd like to introduce uh, for having uh, be recognized, Dr. Ron Weisberger. Dr. Ron Weisberger, our history department. Uh, Ron, there he is over there. <clears throat> Dr. Weisberger is uh, uh, kindly offered to uh, pre uh, make available a free course on Martin Luther King and his writings and the spirit uh, beginning March 5th. It's a free course. Uh, he does this uh, for us every year. And uh, so if you're interested, please uh, uh, be sure to sign up. Uh, you can sign up today afterwards in the back of the cafeteria. Uh, so I thank you, Dr. Weisberger. Also, something like this uh, could not, uh, an event like this could not take place without a group of committed individuals and professionals who uh, uh, give their heart and soul to this project. And I'd like to uh, just quickly acknowledge them. Uh, Co-chairs Tafa Awalaju and Sally Cameron. <laughs> and other members, Philomena Potts, Liz McCarthy, Cindy Poor Parasol, Bob Resendiz, Kevin Spirlett, Linda Viveros, and our own Dr. Weisberger. Please give them a round of applause. And also acknowledge our musicians uh, who have helped us and graced our presence every year uh, with this, uh, Louis Lima and Michael Crawley. 
I would now like to uh, bring up, invite to the stage our trustee, uh, Cynthia Rose, as we move forward to uh, present the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, essay contest winners. Last year, in honor of the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's March, a historic speech at the March in August 63, the Board of Trustees at uh, BCC created an essay competition. Uh, inviting BCC students to write about the meaning of Dr. King's dreams and ideals. A faculty and staff committee headed by English professor Farah Habib took on the challenging task of choosing our winning entries. And I'd like to invite uh, trustee Cynthia Rose to present the awards now. Cynthia, is the third one. Natalie. Okay. Thank you, it's so nice to see all of you here and thank you for supporting us. The first uh, winner is third place, Natalie Santos. Is Natalie here? Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Second place is Anne Sylvia. That's okay. Oh. Okay. Second place is oh. Okay, let me announce that. Second place is a hundred and fifty dollars and the third place was a hundred. Congratulations. Rainy Levesque, $250. And Rainy, he's going to be reading his winning essay. Thank you very much. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. But 100 years ago, the Negro is still not free. Applause falls like rain on the hiss of the ancient recording. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. Applause falls intermittently, fades into 60s hiss and re-swells. We will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Flesh beats together and are united. Shackles rattle and the echo hums hallelujah. Applause falls like water on a hot skillet. Let freedom ring. I have a dream and 100 years later are uttered in hypnotizing clusters, incantatory but also revelatory. A mirage summoned into the world of matter. Anaphora is the repetition of a sequence of words at the beginning of neighboring clauses. Anaphora is the repetition of a foundation to build connecting bridges for related ideas. Anaphora is the repetition of the notion history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Ferguson, Missouri, Memphis, Tennessee. Pasadena, California, Washington, D.C. The diagnosis continues. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. The doctor's voice is his greatest instrument in its composed urgency, and with it he requests us to sing along and not to scream. Again and again we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways. The good doctor stood on an unassuming balcony, quite similar to the first five feet of a bridge, connected to the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. The glint of a scope flickered in the distance, but that's not what he saw. A bullet crossed the street. He greeted it comfortably, allowing it to remove his necktie to lie him down in sunset. A friend from inside the room rushed to find him, seemingly dead. The doctor still had a pulse. He was brought to the hospital where his heart was discovered to be that of a 60-year-old man. The staff seemed confused. The doctor went to sleep. 
years past. As long as our protectors are vulnerable to what we falsely think of as old views, black and white programming broadcast from the reptile brain of our culture, as long as we are vulnerable to prejudice, a version of thinking without thought, we will not hear freedom ring. As long as I accept things the way they are, that is how they will be. 52 years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today nudged us in our sleep. We have a dream. We must, make up to make it, we must wake up to make it real. Thanks. Thank you, Renny. Now please join me in welcoming uh, another one of our community partners, the City of Fall River, and the Honorable Mayor C. Samuel Sutter, who will bring greetings from the city <clears throat> and announce the winners of the poster contest. I hope you've had a chance to look out at the lobby, uh, the, the display of the, all the posters that were entered. Uh, the educators and students worked very hard on this year's contest, and I encourage you to view the results in the front uh, of the lobby there in the front of the building. So now I would invite uh, Mayor Sutter. Welcome aboard. Thank this is one of your first public appearances. Yes, it is. Oh. Oh. <laughs> President Sprague, thank you very much. Uh, before I um, get around to bestowing the awards on the winners, uh, let me thank you for what you do uh, every year, putting this breakfast together. Uh, I've been uh, many times over the past few years, but not in the last couple of years, and it just keeps getting better and better. So um, just like Bristol Community College keeps getting better and better. So the, we owe uh, great thanks to you. One example of that was uh, what I saw as I was driving here. I thought I was a little bit late, so I was quickly looking around trying to figure out which way to go after I came in the entrance. I saw this detour and then the next thing I knew I was looking to my right and seeing solar panel after solar panel after solar panel. Something that we need more and more of. So thank you very much for your commitment to renewable energy. I um, will speak briefly but I want to somewhat echo uh, Congressman Keating's remarks. Uh, I like uh, Bill. I uh, am old enough to remember the 60s very well. I certainly remember that quote. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And uh, obviously today we're celebrating somebody who believed in that credo very passionately. And um, I had the interesting experience yesterday afternoon of uh, driving over to my sister-in-law's in Westport where there was a party to watch the Patriots, so it was around 6.30 and I turned on uh, National Public Radio. And they were doing a program about Mahatma Gandhi's influence on Martin Luther King. And what I didn't know was that uh, for an entire month in 1959, uh, Martin Luther King traveled to India, spent the better part of a month there, and came back more convinced than ever about the wisdom of nonviolence in order to try to change America, which of course worked. And as I was thinking about these uh, remarks today where we honor someone who changed America probably as much as anybody in the history of our entire country and changed America for the much better, much fairer, I kind of married that thought to what I saw on the front page of the globe, which was that um, Russia has now told us, with respect to the biggest problem facing the world, and that is terrorism, hands off, we don't need your help anymore, if I read the article correctly, and I only read the first couple of paragraphs, but I'm pretty sure I got the message. Hands off, we don't need your help to guard our um, plutonium and uranium, which of course is very disturbing. Sam Nunn, who's an expert in these matters, former senator, said, this greatly it increases the risks of a catastrophic incident. And I thought to myself, then thinking about the greatness of Martin Luther King and hit the influence of Mahatma Gandhi, what, and I leave this for all of you, 
What would he tell us to do about this massive problem that we face? So, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask that provocative question. <laughs> but uh, now on to uh, uh, a much um, more cheerful subject, and that is these awards. And by the way, wonderful uh, musical uh, selection, very inspirational. You, uh, the, the group, were fantastic. And also I loved, I think I speak for everybody in the audience, the essay that was just read. So. Here we go. Poster winners. Third, okay. Third place. So the poster winners are third place from the uh, Cuss Middle School, uh, Kimberly Jackson. Is she coming up? Oh, great. Also third place to Christina Rogers from the Talbot Middle School. Thank you, Christina. Also third place to Ethan Zawatsky. I hope I got that name right, Ethan, from the Whitney Academy. Also third place from the Morton Middle School, Amy Lynn Guia. Amy? Well, we'll just save this for Amy. It's just down the street from where I live. Maybe I can go present it to Amy this week. Um, also third place from the Cuss Middle School, Victoria Merkt. Well, Cuss is a little further away from me, but maybe I can make it over there too. <laughs> is this for Victoria? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, right there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Last third place. Okay. And the final third place award to Jasmine Swenson from the Talbot Middle School. from Cuss Middle School, Alyssa Vangsuna. Alyssa. Thank you. Second place, Bradley Cameron from Talbot.
Bradley, you wore the right sweatshirt today. Second place from Talbot, Kiara Marcelino. Kiara. From Cuss, Doa Jamal. one in the group. <laughs> and finally, the final first place award goes to Rayleigh Hubner from the Cuss Middle School. Thank you, Jack. You were great. You were really great. Thank you. So could we have a, a huge round of applause for all of these award winners? Thank you, Mayor Sutter, and thank congratulations to the award winners. Each year we present a Distinguished African American Alumna Award, uh, and it's presented by our BCC Alumni Association. And to recognize this achievement, I would like to introduce and invite to the stage our um, Carol A. Michael, class of 1970, for the B on behalf of the uh, BCC Alumni Association. Carol Michael. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here and um, represent the alumni board. And would my fellow alumni board members that are here please stand up. And remain standing for one minute. And would everyone else in the room that is an alumnus of BCC please stand. Thank you. And uh, you can seek out any member of uh, the alumni board after uh, this um, celebration so that you may get involved with us. And it's my honor this morning um, to represent the Alumni Association. And um, we are thrilled to welcome the 2015 
Distinguished African American Alumna of the Year, Shelly Correa. The BCC Alumni Association is an active part of our BCC community. All BCC graduates and students with 30 or more credits are considered members of the association. Shelley, as the awards committee chair, I was able to read your nomination and I am truly honored to have you here so that our community members can hear your story of success. Shelley has been a true advocate in her community. From her time at Treatment on Demand Incorporated to Harbor House, she continues to support and improve the lives of those she serves. Despite having a busy schedule, Shelley has continued her volunteerism, joining the board of Cape Verdean Association, which is building a community center in New Bedford. The center has brought together immigrants and American-born Cape Verdeans to highlight the unique cultural repertoire of the archipelago. It is clear that Shelley truly deserves to be honored in her alma mater. At this time, I would like to welcome alumna Shelley Correa to accept her award and say a few words. Good morning. Whew, let me shake this off. <laughs> Thank you, Bristol Community College, for this great honor. But the honor goes to Bristol Community College and its truly wonderful educators. When I enrolled at BCC, I was a young woman who had a horrible experience at New Bedford High School. I worked various factory and retail jobs. I had no idea what I wanted to do, except that I knew that I had to go to college for anything to change. Best choice I ever made, thank the Lord. BCC was a perfect learning environment with just the right amount of nurturing. I couldn't slip through the cracks because there were people like Dan Gilbarg and Marlene Pollack, who I call body snatchers. Oh yeah. I received constant guidance from Milton Clements, the minority student advisor at the time. And who could forget Deb Jones, African American Studies, and Dr. Kelly, my creative writing instructor. It was here at BCC that I had learned that I had leadership skills, and I was putting them to good use. Paying it forward, my hope is to inspire young men and women to pursue their education. Now I work with young homeless families who feel stuck because they don't have anything beyond a high school diploma. I stand before them with firsthand knowledge that college changes lives and opens doors. As I look around this room, I am reminded of how blessed I am to have truly been groomed by so many loving, genuine, thoughtful people who inspired my life. My leading ladies, my mama Julia, 85, She's my earth angel, Stella, Diane, my godmother, Dee Dee, my sister, Brenda, Lori, Maria. So in the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., I am returning the gift of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shirley, for inspiring words. Uh, it's now time for another musical interlude from Music One. Music One is going to join us again. <laughs> How you guys doing today? What is it? How you guys doing today? Great. Um, I'm here to, to want to thank the uh, Breakfast Committee, uh, Bristol Community College, 
for putting on such a great Martin Luther King event today. My name is Terrell Osborne. I am the executive director for Music One and mentor to these young ladies. And I also bring you greetings from 95.5 WBRU in the spirit, Southern New England's number one gospel program. And it's a great, great thing that the college is recognizing our young people because our young people are the future, right? And I know people get tired of hearing that, right? Say, man, you keep, everybody keeps saying that, the young people are our future. But you know why people keep saying that? Do you, do you, do you know why they keep saying that? Because it's true, that's right. It's just that simple. And so I'm gonna get out the way and let these young ladies, but this next song is entitled Echoes. It's about when people tell you you can't do things, and you know, and you know you're doing the right thing, that you just keep, you know, power forward. You keep moving forward. You know what I mean? Because God didn't make junk, right? He didn't make junk. And and it's not about the the white race or the black race or the yellow race. It's all about the human race. You know what I mean? And be the change that you want to see. That's what it's all about. Somebody say amen. amen. I can't hear you. You're make some noise so I can talk about it. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Am I on? There check, I check. am. <laughs> all right, guys. So while Terrell makes his way onto the computer, I just want to say once again, thank you very much for having us. I've had a wonderful time. Um, I do have a question. Do we get to see the pictures that the kids drew? Because we were like wondering, they're outside? We'll be going over there checking that out. All right, so like Terrell said, this next song is entitled Echoes, and it goes a little something like this. Beautiful. I've climbed up the 
Music one, ladies and gentlemen. Wasn't that great? <clears throat> now it's my privilege to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Amina Pilgrim. Uh, Professor Pilgrim is Assistant Professor in Africana Studies and African American History at UMass Boston. Um, her research focuses on the African diaspora, uh, Cape Verdean studies, youth empowerment via hip hop, immigrant communities, and gender studies. She's the founder of the Hip Hop Initiative, which uses hip hop to increase critical media literacy. She's also uh, very involved in oral history projects. She, uh, she earned her bachelor's degree at Duke University and her PhD in history at Rutgers University. Uh, you know, many awards and honors uh, and uh, publications. Uh, we're really honored to have her with us. Uh, please welcome, if you will, Professor Amina Pilgrim. I should also add she's a mother of a three-year-old son, Akina. So you want to be sure to say that, right? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to begin by thanking you, Mr. President, Vice President, and Ms. Pont for the invitation to be here and for making it possible uh, for me to be here. I'm honored and humbled at this opportunity to address the life and legacy of one of the most influential people in my own life, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I would also like to pause and ask us to have a brief moment of silence to reflect on his martyrdom and also to reflect on all those people in the world who are suffering right now from the various plagues that we see around us, whether it's the volcano eruption in Cape Verde, the terrorism in Nigeria or France, or the terrorism right here, with all those affected by police brutality. So let's have a moment of silence. Thank you. The title of my talk today is Kindness and Compassion, The Final Frontier. Are there any science fiction fans here besides me? OK, well, as Mr. President mentioned, I do have a son. He's actually four now. And he and I share that interest in science fiction. and. We talk a lot about aliens and robots and things. And so as I prepared for this talk, I thought a lot about my son and his future. And I thought about science fiction because as I was preparing, he was playing with the greeting card that we have, which has Yoda on it. Anybody know Yoda? And when he opened the card, it says, you must unlearn what you have learned. I'm sorry I can't do a Yoda impersonation, but you'll see why that's relevant as I go on. I was asked to speak about three themes. One, unity. Two, how to have an honest dialogue about race. And three, the comment that Dr. King made, that riots are the voice of the unheard. So in my talk, I will attempt to cover all three. And I'll also present some takeaways that I hope we all will leave with today as homework. Challenges on how we can keep Dr. Legacies, uh, uh, Dr. King's legacy alive, excuse me. But I'll start by explaining how legacy works through my own experience. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my path to today and how I met Dr. King, so to speak, through his words, obviously. See, about 10 or 15 years ago, I might not have accepted the invitation to come here. I'm not talking about Bristol Community College, but I'm talking about this area. This area holds a lot of painful memories for me. 
I went to elementary school at St. Joseph's in Fairhaven, and I graduated from Bishop Sang High School. Perhaps some of you in this room have connections to either of those schools. But at both of those schools, I was what we would now call bullied. And I experienced traumatic racism. We don't always think of racism amongst school children as a form of bullying, but that's essentially what it was. I was the only Cape Verdean, I'm also Caribbean, or black girl in my grade from fourth grade almost until high school graduation, with the exception of a few other brown or black faces I was isolated. I was ostracized, I was taunted, and I was made to feel inferior, sometimes by teachers who would say things to me like, how did you get that score on that test? Or how did you do so well on that paper? Your people don't do so well on papers. Needless to say, it hurt. I later learned that the reactions to me were learned. As we know, children learn to fear others. And our society unfairly teaches us to fear certain groups or things. We must unlearn what we have learned. This was one of the most painful chapters of my life. But my mom, who's one of my personal heroes as well, would often quote the Bible and say, forgive them because they know not what they do. But it was during that time that my father introduced me to Dr. King. He sat me down and he told me about the civil rights movement and he made me watch documentaries like Eyes on the Prize. It gave me comfort and I truly connected with the idea that these ordinary people did extraordinary things. And this morning at my table, I had the privilege to meet one of those people, Christine Sears, who was at Selma. And it's an honor to meet you. Can we give her a round of applause? So this is how I met, so to speak, Dr. King and first heard his words. And his words gave me just enough hope to go on. Over the years, I've reflected on one of his great quotes, that you don't have to be great to serve. You don't have to make a subject and a verb agree to serve. You don't have to have a bachelor's degree or a doctorate to serve. Everyone can be great. And so I decided that I wanted to be great. I became but I became so full of hate and bitterness during the painful times that I eventually left Massachusetts and went south for college. That's where, for the first time, I studied African American history. I discovered my own Cape Verdean history through the work of Amilcar Cabral. And I met actual civil rights icons like Rosa Parks, Joseph Lowry, the late Maya Angelou, and Merle Evers. I was extremely blessed. And for the first time, I understood a direct connection between those icons and somebody like me. And I'm only sharing that because I want everyone in the room, especially the young children, to understand that this history is so close to you. All you have to do is reach out and touch it. For example, speaking to someone like Ms. Sears, like Shelley Correa, who have made history or who are making history right now. And those of you that won awards today, you are the ones we have been waiting for, in the words of poet Pearl Klee. As I said, I matured in my understanding while I was in the South. And I became to understand the spiritual core of the civil rights struggle. I also developed meaningful interracial friendships with my peers 
and mentors. Their kindness and compassion in contrast to my painful childhood experiences helped change my attitudes about everything. And I realized that as most of the great teachers and leaders like Dr. King have, have showed us, racism hurts everyone. And we all miss out on each other when we engage in prejudice or in fear. Many of Dr. King's teachings began to be guiding principles for me and still inform my teaching and my work today. For example, Dr. King said, I decided to stick with love. And in the speech in which he said riots are the voice of the unheard, a speech he gave three weeks before his assassination in Detroit, Michigan, he said, the time is always right to do what is right. I grew up Catholic with strong values. I would assume many of us in this room share that commonality. And so those words resonated with me and I couldn't hold on to the hate. This is Dr. King's greatest legacy. He loved us. He loved this country and all of its people so much that he gave its life for it to be better, for us to be sitting here together in this room like we are now. His career began, began at age 15 when he went to college, you could say. He became the youngest Nobel Peace Prize recipient, and in that speech, he said, civilization and violence are antithetical concepts. He recognized that as a country, America had not lived up to its ideals, and today's protests are urging us to recognize that the, this work is not done. If we take seriously Dr. King's comments in his Gross Point speech called The Other America, that riots are the voice of the unheard. He said we have to think about what has been, hasn't been heard. He asked us to think about the country and what we have left to do. And so I asked us to think about what each of us can do. In order to really engage, however, I'd ask everyone to consider that we need to see with new eyes listen with new ears, and feel with a new level of compassion. Speak to one another from a new place of love and kindness. We must understand what Dr. King said, that we are all tied together in a single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. He was asking us to remember what one of the members of Music One said moments ago that we're human first, rather than to hold on to the fictions of race that divide us, because they are fictions. Indeed, we're all connected. Dr. King's speech, again, addressed exactly what I was charged with speaking with today. And so when we think about how to have an, an honest dialogue on race, we need only to look at his words. How do we promote unity? These are not easy questions, like the question the mayor asked us. It's not an easy one. And perhaps it's important to recognize that King himself was attacked for some of his ideas on how we could solve these questions in his own time. He had become more of an internationalist towards the end of his life, and he reframed the problem of racism as a human rights issue, but at that time, that wasn't a popular concept. Fast forward to today, maybe that's something that we can pick up, and people might be able to grasp it more easily. He also was very concerned about economic injustice. His message was twofold, to have the dialogue on race, we need to tell the truth, and we need to examine the true history of the country. To have unity, we need to recognize that what affects one affects us all. He said, injustice anywhere, I'm sure many of you know the quote, is a threat to justice everywhere. Today, protesters feel that they are in a war, 
much like the Vietnam War that Dr. King spoke out against. But this war is local. This is a war to end police brutality, to end the school to prison pipeline, and other issues, to solve the problem of hunger. Many of them are using hashtag reclaim MLK because he was radically courageous in addressing these truths that even today many people aren't ready to accept, but this is necessary. So we have to challenge ourselves again, to be open to seeing with new eyes. And I come back to Yoda and learn what we have learned. Old and young and all ethnicities living here must be open to learning from one another. Again, I want to commend Shelley Correa, Ms. Sears, and all the young award winners, because this is what legacy is in action. We stand on the shoulders of so many great people. Those of us in the room of Cape Verdean descent, we stand on the shoulders of people like Dr. Bruce Rose, who's here, Fairhaven, Salah Mateos, Wareham's Rudy Santos, Harwich's Eugenia Forts, called the Cape Verdean Rosa Parks. If you don't know these names, I would encourage you to learn them. We stand on the shoulders of many so-called white allies who supported the movement, and Asian allies as well, and allies of every ethnicity who believed in the cause of human rights. So I would pause and say that these trailblazers had what Dr. King called a certain kind of fire that no water could put out. For me, that fire means different things. Oftentimes, when people talk about race and racism, it's very uncomfortable. Those words are buzzwords. They make people uncomfortable. But when you think about the struggle against racism, it's essentially a struggle for basic treatment of one another with respect and kindness and dignity. And so this is why I titled the talk kindness and compassion, the final frontier. The fire of compassion, the spirit of love, manifests in small acts of kindness between us, combined with massive direct action, like Dr. King said, could make a huge difference. He said, every person of humane convictions must decide on the protest that best suits his or her convictions, but we must all protest whether you identify with Black Lives Matter, or Je Suis Charlie, or the Fogo volcano victims, or the kidnapped Nigerian girls, or food security, whatever it, issue it is, whatever issue it is that's important to you, we are all connected, and we have to unite to make this place better. In closing, I just want to reiterate what I hope we can all take away and put into action after we leave this morning. Let's remember that small acts of kindness and service can contribute to the global shift that we're seeking. Let's try to move beyond fear of what's different and through compassion get to know one another all over again and make community. Let's listen again with new ears Let's learn our true history, and let's work together, and remember that we're all connected. The late, great Dr. Maya Angelou said, if a human being dreams a great dream, dares to love somebody, if a human being dares to be Martin King, if a human being dares to be bigger than the condition into which she or he was born, it means so can you, and you can stretch stretch, stretch yourself so you can internalize the idea. I am a human being, therefore nothing human can be alien to me. What our country and world faces now are crises of humanity, but if we simply reduce our challenges to small tasks 
and step into the frontier that kindness and compassion would afford us, we can be more human and we can truly make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pilgrim, for those inspiring words. And thank your four-year-old son now, Akina, as well. Uh, that was very, uh, very moving and uh, uh, so, so relevant today. We, uh, uh, we, unfortunately, Dr. King, I say unfortunately, Dr. King's spirit will be with us because why? He's always where injustice is. And, uh, and I think that we're so fortunate to have a mayor who is a, a long career of dealing with injustice, a new district attorney with lengthy experience dealing with injustice, city, state, uh, local uh, uh, officials, in New, especially in New Bedford and Fall River, that know what it takes to make this happen and to, I hope that we can all follow Dr. Pilgrim's inspiring words. So we're about to close up. We're almost right on time. I would like to invite if I could, uh, Rabbi Mark Elber and Cantor Shoshana Brown to come for the benediction. And following the benediction, we shall have our annual uh, ritual, if you will, of a We Shall Overcome. And I, I was going to, she stole my, uh, my thunder, uh, Ms. Sears. I was going to uh, save the last to recognize you. But welcome. We're honored to have you with us. Thank you very much. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. 50 years after the historic march from Selma to Montgomery, we still see how much remains to be done to repair our broken world. As it says in the Talmud, the day is short and the task is great. Hayom katsar you are not obliged to finish the task, neither are you free to neglect it. The task of repairing our world is too great for any one person to achieve, but together we can make a difference. Hashomer achi anochi, we are our brothers and our sisters keeper. Let us always be motivated by love and compassion a love of justice, and a love for our fellow humans, a love for our planet, and for all who inhabit it with us. For truly, we share a common destiny. May the prophetic vision of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King always remind us of our sacred duty to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to strive to create a world in which all can live free and equal, as free and equal citizens in peace and harmony. Amen. After the Hebrew slaves crossed the Sea of Reeds, also known as the Red Sea, they sang a song of victory and thanksgiving to God and I'm going to sing five words from that song in Hebrew, and you're going to learn a little Hebrew and sing with me today. So the words go, Ozi, Vizimrat Ya, Vayahi Li, Lishua, which means my strength, and the might of Yah, but it can also mean the song of Yah, Yah being one of the names of God, will become for me my salvation. The Reverend Martin Luther King would have appreciated this song 
because as much as his power came through love of his fellow human beings, he also could not have done what he did without his faith. Oh, today yes. with uh, the standard of the civil rights movement, we shall overcome, which is in your programs, if it, there's anyone here who doesn't know the words.